Hello, and welcome to Humanities Headlines. I'm George Van de Nabeel, Dean of the School of Humanities at the University of California, Irvine. And I'm happy to be here today with uh, my colleague, Professor David Goldberg, who is a professor of comparative literature and anthropology and a director of the University of California Humanities Research Institute. Uh, and then uh, David is a major scholar on critical race theory and has recently published a book, Are We All Post-Racial Yet? So David, could you say what's the meaning of the title and what is the post-racial? Obviously there's been a lot of claims of the past decade uh, or so um, ramified after President Obama's initial election in 2008 uh, that somehow uh, racism is a thing of the past. Uh, some scholars, Dinesh D'Souza, John McWhorter, and Coulter and others have, uh, on the right have claimed that uh, racism is dead or uh, close to being dead and that, um, to quote one of them, uh, we ought to be over it pretty much by now. Um, people like Shelby Steele and, and, and so on. And so, uh, obviously, if you look at the data, racism is far from dead. I mean, uh, uh, you know, what has happened in the wake of Ferguson, uh, the uh, increased numbers of uh, police violence, of killings, of uh, discrimination, the unemployment figures, uh, almost every index of life conditions that one can point to um, reveals that racism is absolutely not a thing of the past. So the question became um, if, uh, if in any literal sense and in any empirical sense uh, racism is not dead, uh, what work uh, is the notion of the post-racial doing? And indeed what you could press the point and ask what racial work mm -hmm. is the post-racial uh, doing? And so the question are we all post-racial yet, mm -hmm. um, has to do with uh, multiple modalities, who's the we involved? Um, mm -hmm. Are we all post-racial yet? Mm -hmm. I mean, are all of us post-racial? Is everything about our society post-racial? Mm -hmm. And indeed, what, what, uh, what is the post-racial um, uh, amounting to uh, in relation to the history of, of racism? And my counterintuitive um, mm -hmm. answer to the question uh, just to telescope it, is that we indeed are all post-racial already, uh, only not in the sense that uh, most of those who claim us to be uh, think we are. Uh, the argument is that the post-racial is the new mode in terms of which racism operates. Mm -hmm. So the post-racial is a kind of stand-in for um, uh, forms of racism that are no longer explicitly uh, expressed mm -hmm. uh, in, in racial terms. Could one say that if this post-racial America, many ways seems, um, from your description, from my sense of it, uh, to echo a kind of era of reconstruction post-Civil War, uh, which then slavery is abolished, but then new forms of exploitation racism evolved and, and forms of racial violence evolved. And, things like that, and um, in particular, I think, uh, you know, with the um, uh, experiential racism described, the, um, you know, uh, incredible, you know, horrific kind of iconography around um, President Obama, that seems to generate this kind of, like, then it's, it's, it's we're, we're, you know, slavery's gone, but something, Jim Crow exists, and no, racism gone, but something else yeah. exists. I mean, does that seem? No, I, I think that's a very interesting observation. I mean, obviously it takes uh, new and different forms, yeah. uh, but it, uh, the, the logic of its production and reproduction, mm -hmm. um, you know, seem to mirror those, uh, uh, those, those critical moments in uh, American history. Uh, so that reconstruction, you know, was, uh, a kind of patting on the back, look, we're over slavery, yeah. people are able to uh, vote, people are able to reach for um, um, political office and so on and so forth. 
uh, of course, it lasted, you know, not even a decade, right? And uh, and and then began the pushback uh, under Jim Crow laws and 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 under uh, a, a, you know, an attempt to uh, restrict and and restrain uh, the capacity of, uh, in this case, uh, African Americans to to get ahead. Mm -hmm. The the new logics that um, operate under the condition of post-raciality. Uh, I, I think are genuinely new, right? Mm -hmm. The racial logics of, of, of post-raciality. So the first thing to point out is that there's a kind of privatization uh, of, of racism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that the society absolves itself of the responsibility of the structural condition that enables the reproduction mm -hmm. uh, of, of racism across the time. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I like to point to so uh, repeal Calif of the Voting Rights Act, yeah, exactly. uh, pushback on affirmative action. Exactly. Uh, that's all exactly. been done. Therefore, needs no longer to be done. Right, so and and the society, the the you know, formally in in state terms, in legal terms, mm -hmm. um, uh, erases any reference to racial condition. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, so you see it in a way in which. Uh, Right, um, uh, there should be no public funding of affirmative action, or there right. should be no uh, public reference to racial distinction. There should be no hiring or uh, admissions or um, housing determination on the on 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 the ba basis of racial reference. Uh, it's fine for private individuals in their private lives with their own funding to do whatever they want mm -hmm. and say whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if it's uh, you know r r racially in racial terms quite awful, right? Uh, but the state has no business in going to tell them mm -hmm. uh, that they can or cannot do this, mm -hmm. right? So long as they're using their own resources. So if uh, you know if I own an apartment building and I don't want to rent uh, to uh, this or that person on the basis of this or that racial characterization, uh, and I'm not taking uh, funds or I'm not getting a tax writer for anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm on the basis of doing it, then, you know, the argument goes, uh, I, I would have every right to, to, uh, to do it, even if it ends up uh, having racially pernicious effects, right, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, o o over time. And so um, this privatization of racism, you saw it um, in what was a failed attempt um, on the part of Ward Connolly in 2004 yeah. in California called the Racial Privacy yeah. Act. The Racial Privacy Act right, was not the Ending of Racism Act, right? It was saying that uh, with the use of state resources, other than for two interesting exceptions, you could not use race to collect data, you could not use mm -hmm. race to discriminate in any way uh, on, on the part of state institutions. The, the, um, the exceptions were, were pretty interesting. I mean, one was for medical research, mm -hmm. for medical condition, right. right? So Ty Sachs disease or something like that. Uh, uh, um <coughs> Uh, on the one hand, and the other, of course, is criminalization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, profiling uh, for suspects could be, you could use okay. racial okay. identification, yeah. right, mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Um, that failed on the ballot, um, happily. Um, but, uh, th you know, it, it's, um, it's indicative in the sense that what it meant to say was that not only could people in their private lives without state resources discriminate to their heart's content, but they would be protected by the state mm -hmm. in being able to discriminate to their heart's content, right. you know, because it's a, a private condition. It's a private, uh, a private preference scheme mm -hmm. that they were expressing uh, and so on. So the, the post-racial as a racial condition operates by privatizing race. And then, you know, when, when a person does express themselves in racist ways, they pointed to as the anomaly, as mm -hmm. the exception to the rule, mm -hmm. as the bad apple mm -hmm. right in the basket and so on and so forth, uh, which absolves the society of any responsibility while, yeah. while, while blaming. And then other ways in which the post-racial operates is, is a kind of racial reversibility, mm -hmm. blaming the victim for their own condition, mm -hmm. uh, saying that you know, people are acting out and they should just learn to live with it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the, the way in which I say it uh, is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm no longer apolo apologizing for, uh, for, for the offense I am giving you. Mm -hmm. I'm apologizing if you're offended, if you're offended right? Yeah. So, so, so it's putting on to the person who's Offense. bearing the offense, yeah. right? Uh, uh, for the condition, not for me, for expressing. Though. 
how would you think we should be addressing these issues in a university environment, which I think is still, in my view, a highly privileged mm. one that, that has not really engaged these kind of questions? Well, the, I, it's an important um, question, obviously one absolutely relevant uh, to our present moment, both uh, here in the United States, you're seeing similar, um, you know, um, engaged kinds of um, movements uh, appearing in South Africa mm -hmm. around forms of inequality, which these things speak to uh, as, as well. Um, in the case of the, of the institutions of higher education in the United States, there are a number of things at work, right? I mean, first, the numbers are pretty dismal. Uh, I mean, the, uh, both at the student level, I mean, particularly for African Americans, uh, Latinos as well, um, uh, both at the student level uh, and, and there's a kind of almost a tunneling uh, effect, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if it's a bit wider, three, four percent is the average yes. uh, on, on, on campus uh, of those populations. You know, as you get to graduate, st uh, uh, graduate students, it winnows down, and then obviously as you get to faculty, it gets even narrower, right? And there, it's multidimensional, the, the uh, conditions that are producing that. Um, you know, um, those from uh, population groups who tend to be less well off uh, might choose professions better paying than, uh, mm -hmm. uh, than uh, you know, college faculty and so on. Uh, but there are also um, material conditions at work within the university itself, making them less friendly to uh, 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 people uh, of, of color generally and African Americans in, in particular. And so, um, climate issues, uh, cr uh, climate issues yeah. the fact of having to walk um, across campus and be subjected to those forms of humiliation, uh, dismissive racisms, uh, the forms of expectation or lack of expectation. Uh, the, you know, um, students have, been comp have complained about having their hair touched, uh, about inappropriate remarks, about, I mean, just the, the conditions that r reproduce a kind of feeling that, um, that one doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and having to perform under those conditions it just becomes exhausting, yeah. right? And the sense of exhaustion, I think, wears on, you know, uh, on, on people in addition to the ordinary exhaustion of, of student life, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, produced by a variety of considerations. And so it's just that, that wearing feeling, right, um, uh, of um, uh, both um, not feeling welcome on campus and also, um, you know, having one's histories dismissed, having one's uh, sense of being in place mm -hmm. dismissed, having those uh, things relevant to your history and social life dismissed and so on and so forth, just add up over time and, and, and become... Um, you know, uh, utterly uh, degrading to the point mm -hmm. of, you know, why should I put up with this? Mm -hmm. uh, let me go elsewhere or do something else with my, my life. And, uh, and, and that too, uh, of course, is wrong. Um, you know, it's probably all the more difficult that in many cases we're dealing with uh, students who are first generation coming in and then, then it becomes, it's always a difficult right. process to translate and negotiate with one's own parents or family, what one's going through and why this is important. Yeah. And, um, you know, so the, you, you're getting it on both sides. Yeah, there's that. And then there's also the, you know, the increased um, recourse to free speech so people can say whatever they want, right? right? Uh, there's a sense of, um, of uh, you know, even, even if you're, you're doing well, um, you know, that, that sense of having to, uh, outperform everybody just to show that you can do it. Uh, uh, the sense of, um, of, of, you know, of, of the university being a middle class institution, both in the sense that the middle class are expected to attend, mm -hmm. uh, and and your, you know, and and the university produces a kind of middle class sensibility, right? And if you're not from the middle class, uh, you already feel sort of at, at, at odds with the institution uh, in certain sorts of ways and certain sorts of behavior and so on. So the, 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 um, the interaction between class and race sort of uh, 
uh, runs quite deep too. The fact that um, increasingly the language of race is dismissed or taken away or is seen to be um, ill-advised to use as an explanation of what's going on uh, means even the language of critique is unavailable to one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's wrong with you? You, you must be seeing things that aren't really there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Or I, I didn't intend it, yeah. right? Uh, and if I didn't intend it, it couldn't possibly have been the yeah. case that, uh, that I'm expressing myself in a racist way. The other thing I think is also, you know, the, the, the drumbeat of attack against affirmative action, mm -hmm. um, where affirmative action has been the kind of, almost the default institutional apparatus mm -hmm. or technology in order to sort of bring uh, those who, you know, hitherto were not um, in, in larger numbers uh, in the institution, mm -hmm. into the institution. Um, and, you know, this would be unpopular, but it, maybe it's run its course not in the sense of, of the right-wing critique of we should make no reference to race and, uh, uh, you know, you should be able to cut it on, uh, on your own individual efforts and so on and so forth. But in the sense that we need to think, I think, in much more creative ways about a, yeah, and some institutions clearly do this, um, uh, about an emissions policy um, where, uh, um, you know, maybe non-standard criteria for determining what, uh, what contributions mm -hmm. students can make, what, uh, uh, what forms of qualities they represent, right, uh, should be represented in, in university institutions. I know one, it happens to be a graduate program at a, um, not in the University of California, not even in California, where without recourse to affirmative action, um, they admit, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's a program on leadership studies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, fully one third of approximately 120 graduate students uh, are, are people of color, right? Mm -hmm. Without any self-conscious okay. affirmative action program, but by looking for leadership qualities mm -hmm. that people represent as a result of their personal experiences, their work experience, the fact that they've uh, you know, come out of different kinds of uh, challenges and experiences and so on and so forth. So when one, when one broadens the criteria, mm -hmm. when one opens it up, not giving up on the quality of mm -hmm. intellectual capacity right. and so on, but opens it up to these other considerations, it, it, you know, it, it means that the pool is enlarged in a variety of interesting right. ways and it's likely to get at the range of diversities and the range of diverse experiences mm -hmm. you know, that are racially represented without, without being yeah. determined uh, as such in any explicit kind of way. Well, thank you very much and uh, thank you. Um, for this uh, Humanities Headlines. We've been talking to Professor David Theo Goldberg. I'm George Van Den Abiel, Dean of the School of Humanities at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, thank you, and we'll see you at our next Humanities Headlines. <laughs>